Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here today uh, with this uh, esteemed group of experts as we talk about how the rubber hits the road. Uh, before I kind of get in and tee this up, I'd like to have our panelists please introduce themselves, okay? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Abe Diamond, the Chief of Staff of the Public Company County Oversight Board. Hi, everybody. I'm Jen Haskell. I am the Deputy Chief Auditor of Deloitte & Touche U.S. and the Global Methodology Leader for our network. Afternoon. I'm Josh Jones. I'm a partner with uh, Ernst & Young in their National Professional Practice uh, Audit Group. Good afternoon, everybody. Philip Austin. I lead our audit methodology, learning, innovation, and transformation group in the U.S. And like Jen, I serve as our international uh, steer on our audit methodology and development within the global firm. Thank you all for your investment of time here today. And uh, uh, we're energized and excited as we talk really for the next 90 minutes about, you know, if you think about critical audit matters and CAMs, uh, the time is now, and so we're going to take the majority of our time here um, and, and talk about uh, where we go next with respect to CAMS. The panel this morning did an outstanding job talking about the theoretical approach to standard setting and uh, how we identify as a profession uh, new standards, revised standards, and then how we as firms think about uh, the impact that those things have on our methodology, our practice, and our processes. Um, we're going to use really the first part of this specifically to talk about critical audit matters, obviously with the June 30 uh, implementation uh, for large accelerated filers uh, just even in the past few days, as was discussed this morning. Um, you have a lot of filers out there now who have, for the very first time, uh, have their CAMs, and uh, there's a lot to learn in that regard, and so we'll talk some, some more about that. Um, you know, you think about implementation, you think about all that goes into this, it really has been probably a two-year journey for most of our firms um, as we think about when the PCOB first made uh, the auditor's reporting model effective. Uh, the SEC then approved that in the fall of 2017. And you think about uh, all the dry runs, and we'll talk a little bit more about dry runs and the impact that's had. And you think about how we get our people and teams ready. Um, you know, I think you'll gain a lot from this. Um, we have a couple of questions at the end really focusing on the academic community. Um, as, uh, as you can imagine and appreciate, this really is an area that's ripe for academic research. So we're anxious to talk about that as well. So without further ado, um, Abe would like to uh, provide a disclaimer, and then we'll jump right into this. <laughs> that really is in my notes, okay? I had to take that. I was telling Mark my disclaimer will be longer than my introduction. Uh, I am required to tell you that uh, I speak only for myself, and no one else at the PCOB may, uh, may or may not uh, agree with what I'm about to say. <laughs> Thank you, Abe. Thank you very much. We're going to start, if we think about, as I mentioned, the audits of the large accelerated filers uh, with the June 30, 19 year ends. Um, auditors are required to communicate CAMS for the very first time in our reports. Um, firms have been ramping up for a number of years. I think a good place to start, Abe, talk about the definition of a CAM so we're all level set, and a brief reminder of the PCAOB's objectives uh, for requiring the inclusion of CAMS in our reports. Sure. So um, with all the information we've put, been putting out lately, uh, hopefully you've all read it all and are, uh, I'm repeating uh, uh, what's uh, commonly accepted now, but uh, the PCAB adopted the new auditor reporting standard uh, in t the, the end of 2018. Uh, and as I mentioned this morning, it included a number of enhancements to the audit report. Um, one of those, uh, the second part of it really was uh, the requirement for auditors to report on critical audit matters. Um, critical audit matters are those uh, matters that arose during the audit of the financial statements that in, uh, were communicated or required to be communicated with the audit committee and that relate to um, accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements and that involved especially challenging subjective or complex auditor judgment. Um, as Mark said, the uh, effective date of that requirement um, took place for large accelerated filers for uh, June 30 year end uh, uh, filers uh, this, this year. Uh, and then for all other filers, it takes effect uh, in December of 2020. Um, auditors are required to disclose in the audit report then um, it's critical audit matters. Um, they're required to describe, identify the critical audit matter, describe the pr uh, principal considerations that led the auditor to conclude the matter was a critical audit matter, 
um, describe how it was addressed during the audit, and finally to refer readers to the accounts or disclosures that relate to the critical audit matter. Um, and I would be remiss uh, to not say that it is possible for auditors to not have a critical audit matter and they need to disclose if that's the case as well. Uh, the objective of the board in um, establishing this requirement really was to make the auditor's report more informative and useful uh, to readers of the auditor's report, uh, thereby giving them more information for which they could understand the, the financial statements. Um, and I would like just like to add uh, to, to Mark's comment about the panel this morning, I thought the panel did an excellent job of describing the standard setting process that got the, the board to uh, adopting this particular standard and, and others as well. Um, I just wanted to con add uh, an additional comment that uh, we, uh, we have a, a new chief auditor now, she's uh, joined about six months ago, uh, and with an entirely new board, the board has undertaken the process of evaluating our current research and standard setting agenda, make decisions about what to do with those agendas, um, including making some decisions about uh, existing projects. Um, and part of that uh, challenge was also to be um, as supportive and effective as possible in making sure recently adopted standards are implemented effectively. So, um, I, when I mentioned before that we've put out a lot of information and guidance that we'll talk about uh, this afternoon, the board really is dedicated to making sure uh, the critical audit matter requirement and other standards are effectively implemented and being as supportive and engaged as possible in, in doing that. Abe, thanks, and maybe one more follow-up point. If you think about the significance of this change to the auditor reporting model, um, uh, through each step of the process there was, there was significant interaction with the various stakeholders um, as part of the PCOB's outreach efforts um, during the rulemaking process. Can you please speak to some of those efforts and then ultimately the, the impact or influence those conversations had on, on, on the rulemaking process? Sure, the, uh, the auditor's reporting model uh, project uh, took quite a long time. Uh, it was in, in uh, works for several years. Uh, the board undertook three rounds of public comment from a concept release to proposal and a reproposal. Um, the board uh, received hundreds of comments uh, on that on those um, documents. I think the most of any of the projects uh, to date. Um, the board engaged its advisory groups, had an, had a round public roundtable meeting, um, and engaged in a number of additional out outreach and discussions, including with the firms and the CAQ and understanding some of the uh, thinking that they were doing uh, behind the different alternative uh, constructs of, of uh, the, the revised auditor's report that was under consideration at the time. So a very active and robust um, rulemaking process, I think. Okay. Jen, maybe you could, you could speak now to some of the concerns that might have been raised during that process by the various stakeholders. Um, preparers, auditors, audit committees, investors. Um, could you speak a little bit to that, maybe how some of those concerns were ultimately addressed in the final rule? Sure. <clears throat> um, as Abe said, you know, this is such a sea change from many, many decades of how auditor reporting worked in the past. So I think everybody went into it uh, with, I guess, a fair amount of trepidation, but a good understanding of what we were trying to achieve for investors and readers and other stakeholders. And so then it was just a matter of how do we make this, um, to another point, Abe raised, an effective implementation. And so what are the key issues that, um, as you look at something that is such a significant difference, you know, how, how do you come to a reckoning of what to, to do with them? So for an example, um, there was a lot of concern that original information would be given in the auditor's report. And, um, and that, we needed to therefore put up a good framework for how to prevent that from happening because as we know, auditors are not giving original information about entities and so um, through dialogue with the PCOB when, with others um, and collaborative efforts, the final rule makes it very clear that you're focused on, as Abe described, the sort of funnel of information of what you've communicated and how it relates to the financial statement. So that was a great way of mitigating that concern. Um, I think there were other concerns that came through the passage of time and thinking about the implementation around things like significant deficiencies. And if you had a significant deficiency, 
would that be a CAM and how would you deal with that? And there was a lot of really great guidance put out um, just in March of 2019 and May of 2019 that really makes it very clear and kind of simple language how you factor in things like significant deficiencies to your CAM thinking that were really, really helpful. So all along the way, this has been a multi-year process. I think all constituencies have been very engaged in making it a successful one, understanding that the purpose is, is a broader set of useful information for people, and then it's just working together to get to um, a consistent set of clear guidance so that people know what they're doing. Excellent, thank you. Sure. Josh. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think just building off what Jen said, I think investors had a lot of feedback during the, during the comment process as well, it was around, you know, really the goal of this is to provide them further insights into the audit, which would help, as Abe said, help them better analyze a company's financial statements. And so one of the concerns they had was, you know, what, what, what can the standard do to help promote, you know, kind of providing some of that clarity without making all of the disclosures kind of, or descriptions of CAMS kind of sound the same. And so I think one of the, the challenges the PCOB had and, and we're working through and we'll talk about a little more today around the implementation is, is really focusing the CAM descriptions on, on why a matter is particularly challenging, complex or subjective, how that correlates to, you know, the company's perspective on those matters as evident through the filing and then describing it in a way that, that clearly re represents kind of how the audit team thought about it and how the audit team addressed it. And so working through um, how the, the, uh, the standard is really intended to help promote kind of that um, audit specific kind of uh, kind of discussion is was really important and something that I think the PCB tried to achieve in the in the, in the implementation. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, I think we probably covered the nature of what people said up front that was dealt with, and the board has been really responsive in this standard in outreach, outreach to the firms, outreach to the market. One of the fundamental concerns people had carrying into the standard is yet untested. And that's what are users going to do with the information they thought should have been in an audit report and in hindsight wasn't. And that's a piece where we're just going to have to continue to, to watch what happens. Uh, there was clarity in the board's position that this standard wasn't intended to increase auditor liability. Um, I think we're still of the view that it will increase the amount of time we spend defending that it didn't increase auditor liability, and that will come with time, because what's going to happen is somebody's going to lose some money, the company's going to go uh, southward, and then somebody's going to look back at an audit report and say, well, I think if you had only put an additional CAM in, or you had put more emphasis on this aspect, I would have viewed it differently, and that's, that's going to be probably the trickier part of the next five years as we see how the standard works out. Thank you, Philip. And Mark, if I can sure, please to just add that uh, the th themes of original information and boilerplate issues and potential litigation risk and liability issues were among those that frequently came up during the, uh, the public discussions that the board had, and I think it really benefited from active engagement um, by commenters through the process, and like as I said, hundreds of comments provided competing and, and helpful perspectives on, on those questions that really helped the board work through it, including discussions with the firms and academics and others. Um, really, the, I think the board really benefited from that active engagement. Yeah, it was critical, I mean, throughout that entire process. Josh, we're gonna go next to um, implementation. So as we, as we take this next step in the, in the journey, uh, we often talk about dry runs as a, as a firm, as, as firms, excuse me. And if I go back again to mid-2017 to late-2017 when um, this, was, this became effective, uh, the firms have actively been using dry runs to prepare for implementation. Is that typical? And um, you know, what are the types of things that, uh, what, what made this unique if it's not typical in terms of using a dry run as you prepare? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think, you know, just thinking back to the, to the earlier panel, I think Dave and Christian said it pretty well. I think anytime there's a new auditing standard, there's a lot of time being spent analyzing, you know, what's the intended objectives of, of the revi revised or new auditing standard? How does that correlate to what we do today uh, to make sure that we're evaluating, you know, whether we're achieving kind of the objectives. And so we, you know, we do, we do some format of getting that feedback, you know, not only challenging ourselves as we're developing the guidance, but going out and getting some feedback um, during the course of the, the, the implementation process to kind of challenge whether, 
you know, we're thinking about it the right way and whether we're writing kind of guidance and enabling um, our methodology in a way that's achieving kind of those benefits. I think as we reflected on, on critical audit matters, given the significance of the change, this is the, the, the one kind of product that is visible to investors, uh, and given the level of feedback that, that they mentioned that was received during the comment process, we, we realized you know, dry runs, you know, that, that effort we normally undertake was gonna need to be kind of put on steroids, if you will, because it's just a significant kind of impact to the practice for a number of reasons. One is, it's, it's the end product of our work, right? And so achieving the objectives of providing investors with informed and useful audit reports is really important. And so from our perspective, you know, challenging how we guide our teams, we, um, from a methodology perspective, the enablement we provide, um, and giving them the opportunity to, in essence, to practice for, for a year, um, in some cases two years, um, we thought was really important to, to one, from a system of quality control perspective, giving us some perspective as to how, you know, the stuff we're putting together resonates and whether or not it's achieving kind of the benefits we, we uh, believe the, the PCO is looking to, to achieve. Um, but also to give our teams, I think, just, just the opportunity to practice, right? Writing customized audit reports is something that's fundamentally a new practice for our teams. The audit reporting process up to this point has, you, know, you spend all your time really focusing on the conclusion. The audit report has been something that's fairly um, static, right? So that process hasn't engendered maybe as much subjectivity in terms of developing the audit report. So giving them the opportunity to practice was really helpful. And at the same time, you know, companies, you know, commented a lot and had raised lots of concerns in the process and they asked lots of questions during the process around, well, what types of matters are gonna be identified as part of this process? When am I gonna find out about them? What exactly are you gonna say about, about them? These are my financial statements. What are you gonna say and how can I prepare for that um, during the course of the process? So giving you know, companies the opportunity to kind of see the output and how this process was gonna impact you know, kind of the audit reporting process, how they could be thinking about that as they're preparing their financial statements was also a really important objective as well and why, you know, we've, we viewed the dry run process this year as being, you know, that much more important and, ne and needed to be pretty comprehensive given the unique um, challenges that CAM reporting provided. Thank you, Josh. Jen, do you have any additional observations on how Deloitte structured uh, their dry run process? Um, well, I agree with everything Josh said. Um, what we did was we decided to have a dry run for um, our global network at once. So we did dry runs on all of the foreign private issuers uh, at the same time. So we did about 450 total for um, the large accelerated filers, and then we're continuing to dry run for the other filers. I, I think to Josh's point, um, it was very necessary to do a dry run given all of the constituencies in the process. You know, not only you get to the end where you're having folks who are largely not English majors for a reason, <laughs> trying to break down some complicated topics into really easy to understand language so that a user, you know, I always put it in the context of my mom would get, you know, <laughs> lots of things from her investments. You know, if she read this, would she have any clue what people were talking about? Um, so, it, it, and I, I'm not sure we're quite there yet. I think we've made a lot of strides, but just to have that skill set is really something people were not used to. So that's the end of it. But then to get through the funnel of, well, what did we tell the audit committee, you know, of that, what relates to material accounts or disclosures, and then what meets the subjective challenging test. And so that thought process really bears a lot of deliberation. Because if you want the standard to work effectively, you really need to give each and every uh, measures on, the, on that pathway the right thought. So I'm glad we did it for sure, and we will continue to do it for the other filers until they go live. Very good. Philip, any differences in, in BDO's approach yeah, to dry I, runs? I, I would dial this back to your starting question about how do we systemically think about new standards. And I think the critical audit matter standard was probably the first of a series of audit standards where the standard setters are allowing more time before the effective date. So we have estimates and specialists, which has an extra year of before it takes effect to uh, I think ISQM is probably going to have two or three years. But what that's given us is the opportunity to start thinking about the research phase, but putting a time boundary around it. So one of the things you learn about technical people is give us a research bone and we'll gnaw on it for a very, very long time. Uh, what we had to do with critical audit matters is discipline ourselves so we, we now have to implement the standard before it's required. And that becomes the second piece of the discipline of how do you implement in large scale or small scale a standard that's not yet effective. And you know, this standard is a reporting standard, it's a communication standard, other standards are execution standards, but how do you actually go and target different use cases and say, does this work? 
Uh, so we have a system now where we go out globally and in the US and we give people prototype use cases. Uh, we had a session in Chicago on the SM standards a couple of months ago. We put all our global technical leaders in a room and we made them do audit use cases. We made them sit and apply the standard. And so, well, fine, now could you apply it? Now we've taken that and we've taken it out to our audit team and said, well, now here it is, see if you can apply it. Uh, and that becomes part of the circle you have to walk. So by the time you have the year of first effectiveness, you've already applied the standard on a number of engagements of different scale, different locations, and then you can swing it into broad scale adoption. That process, certainly in my experience in, in, in this uh, profession, is getting different today to where it was five years ago or 10 years ago, where you take a new standard and say, well, we'll take three years to perfect this, so we're gonna muddle our way through it and in three years time we'll know what we're doing. You know, from our firm's perspective, you know, as we think about the dry runs that continue to this day, they really have been the foundation for many of the tools um, and the, the training that we've conducted and that, that efforts will continue. So um, the output of that has been, has been excellent. Um, continuing with this theme, you know, as you think about the various cons constituencies, as you mentioned this, um, what are some of the key observations from the dry runs? What have we learned? What have we learned as we continue to go through these? Uh, yeah. What I've learned is that uh, behavioral obstacles are bigger than you expect. Um, <laughs> we deal with the technical issues. It's a communication. It's observable. We can put a communication on a list. Uh, we say to somebody now, is it particularly subjective, complex, in your thinking, uh, in, in the way the order looks at it, and then you run into the behavioral incident. Well, it wasn't complex to me because I know the entity and I've known it for five years. All right, so now I'm gonna walk you back from that. Um, it wasn't only subjective because I'm really expert at my craft. I know how to do that thing. <laughs> I'll walk them back from that. And then I, I found the one that surprised me was a number of auditors who thought of a CAM somewhat like a matter of emphasis or qualification something to be studiously avoided unless you had to do it. And you had to walk people back from that. So this is just a communication. It's just a communication of what it is. Um, that was probably my kind of aha Key takeaways. Yeah, you know, the other stuff was technical and we worked through it. Watching auditors struggle with these three behavioral elements, so that was different. Yeah. No, I, I think, Phil, we had a lot of the similar, similar reactions. I think teams, you know, once, you have an experience with, you know, with these large accelerated filers. They have, you know, typically have pretty robust controls. We've audited them for some period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, teams come at it a lot of times. Well, I've, I've, I have a good playbook for running the audit, right? So nothing seems particularly challenging. And so having some of those discussions kind of anchoring off of, off of all the things you said, mm -hmm. hey, look, it's, you know, what we do is really important. Not anybody can do it, right? So let's, let's, and, let's and talk about what those and, and There like. is some kind of objective standard to what you want to put in, not yeah. just, how expert am I at my trade? Otherwise, first year audit partners would have 10 or 12 CAMs and deeply experienced audit partners would have very few. Right. I think one of the other interesting things we saw as well is the kind of how some, some folks apply the especially challenging, complex and subjective kind of mm -hmm. threshold. I think, you know, the PCOB spent a lot of time, you know, really, I thought doing a good job explaining what they meant by that threshold relative to what the IAASB has put in their standard around most, the areas that are most significant to the audit. And in, in some discussions w with teams, it was, well, it's especially challenging. That's gotta be, you know, really, really, really high. It's gotta be multiples of your planning materiality. And, you know, and so you had these really, um, you, had, you know, heading some situations where the threshold was so high, it was really hard to identify um, maybe some matters that you would otherwise have a lots of complexity and subjectivity um, involved in it. And so those were areas too where, again, training and, and making sure our, you know, our methodology kind of resonated from that perspective uh, was, was, really, it was really helpful and really important. So as you think about the scrutiny that will now be applied to these critical audit matters as they're disclosed and scrutiny by national office, scrutiny by investors, regulators, you, know, you get to this concept and we talk about it all the time um, you know, the need to not have boilerplate CAMs, but still wouldn't firms want to have standardization across engagement teams? Josh, could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so to, you know, one of the things that resonated with us too, to Jen's point, not all, not all of us are English majors. I absolutely was not an English major, um, if anybody <laughs> interacts with me. Wrong with it. Yeah, and so um, if folks that I've worked with in the past were laughing about that, yes, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but I think the idea of, you know, certainly um, from our perspective, we, you, you wanted, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key objectives is to provide investors with that kind of insight that's audit specific. And so you want certainly to make sure um, that our, we're driving teams to be very specific around what's driving the matter 
um, to be challenging, complex, you know, why that's the case and, and how, and be articulate around how we address that in the audit. But at the same time, you want to do that in a, in a way that's, that's prudent from a risk management perspective. And, you know, there's, you know, obviously, a, you know, one of the concerns I think we had is having situations where it appears as though we're providing maybe a separate opinion on those matters. And so it was really important to us to have, you know, some writing guidance and some tools to help our teams think through the right type of language, the right types of conclusion statements, and th or, not, or lack of conclusion statements, I guess I should say, that really helps articulate what we did in a way that conveys, you, here are some of the important procedures that we did, so that when someone picks up, you know, an, an Ernst & Young report, you know, they can't necessarily tell that, that Josh Jones wrote it as opposed to somebody else, right? It has, it kind of resonates, it has a similar tone and level of detail, but at the same time accomplishes the objective of providing kind of audit specific you know, type of language to address why the matter was challenging and how we addressed it in the audit. So it's a, you know, so it's between developing kind of the right writing guidance as well as, you know, kind of prudent use of examples. It's a, it's a challenging balance to make because you, you want to, again, foster those right, those right types of, of, of actions, but at the same time do it in a way that you're comfortable with can be, can be applied consistently, which is why the, again, the dry run process was so important to kind of help, help feeling that way out. I think what we saw happen, and this was a, a choice firms make, we chose not to be provide examples. Um, we chose, chose to do that for a number of different reasons, but one of the primary ones is we wanted people to actually get through the intellectual energy of framing their thoughts before they were tainted with examples, and that's just a choice firms make. That had some interesting out outcomes, so we, we ran into situations then when our CAM subject matter team had to re-educate people on the use of the English language. One of the <laughs> principles in the PCA standard is this has to be understandable. <laughs> you get something in the ASC, this, that, the next thing, this subparagraph, and no, hang on, stop. Just tell me in plain English, what are you talking about? Um, which proved to be an interesting exercise in re-educating uh, auditors to speak in more apparent plain words that were accessible to others. Um, and that, that became quite a piece of the piece that also gets to non boilerplate because now somebody's having to rethink how do I describe what I'm doing for a non-technical audience. And the more technical the industry, the more that risk increased. Um, insurance, banking, mining, energy and resources, suddenly having people to unpack deeply technical terms and say, now I need to explain this so somebody else can know what I'm talking about. I think they'll be thinking about you, Mom. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the other thing I would say is I think the important learning point that you, something might be a CAM um, company X but not company Y and they're very, very similar companies otherwise but you have to go back to the audit and that it was especially subjective or complex or challenging on that audit in the, those circumstances. So that might be that the way the company value, uh, you know, um, comes up with its estimate is a slightly different, has a slightly more complicated valuation technique and on that in that circumstance, it's a cam for that one, but not for the other one. I think time will tell and research will show whether there's an expectation of the marketplace that people are going to look at something and say, well, I see it here, I would expect to see it here, why don't I? And, and I think, you know, to the other points, that's the, that's the balance you create. I think some of it we just need to let time pass and see what the reactions are. But what we've tried to encourage is, um, is to, to take it and from a very unique perspective. From an examples approach, we actually did something different. We, we started with an example and then we actually made more than one example to try to prove to people that if you have this circumstance, these aren't the right words to use. These are words for you to think about, but these are also equally useful words. And again, um, to give people a little bit of a mm -hmm. steer. We also had quality reviewers and continue to have quality reviewers in all of our CAMs, which is a small group of people from our, largely from our professional practice network. And I think having them there, um, you know, less familiar with the entity and the audit, but more familiar across a broad array of reports has been helpful to try to sort of eliminate unnecessary differences that might cause question marks in reader's mind, but to focus on the uniqueness of each situation. Let's continue I, on with that quality I, process a little bit. I mean, I'm sure every firm is different, but maybe speak a little bit about to the specific quality control processes that, that you've all put in place in that regard. So we had something very similar to, to what Jen describes, people who are focused on the CAM subject matter expertise, and they do provide this consistency of challenge. So when a team says, 
what do you mean by plain speak? I don't know what that means. We go back and say to the team, you said this to the audit committee. Now you're saying it's not particularly subjective, complex. Really? Those weren't the words you used over here, and I helped walk me through it, which is important. Uh, but we've added a step on top of that. Our SEC review function, we've kept deliberately a step aside, and we ask them to read the report through the lens of if this is what's in front of me, does it make sense? So having read the financial statements, having thought about the context, I'm now just reading the report. Because that's, that's the person you're always trying to imagine, the person whose only reference point is pick up and read. Uh, and that's been a pretty good part of our quality control function, because they often come back and say, listen, I'm sure you were meaning to say something, but this is what I'm reading. Is that what you meant? And that's allowing teams to calibrate the language through the lens of somebody who has no other anchored knowledge in the process. Yeah, I'd, I'd say our process is, is very similar, I think, you know, for our you know, June to September year ends, we're you know, going through a process where you know, we, we, we probably do a deeper dive, kind of, Philip, as you mentioned, and, and for a subset of our calendar year ends where we do a deeper dive to understand how they're communicating to the audit committee and accumulating those communications, going through the determination process, and then obviously um, going through and reviewing the report. I think from a, from a broader perspective, I, I think, you know, similar, we kind of thought this was a good, given the significance of the change and, and given how important it is, having an independent, someone independent of the team kind of, kind of look at, you know, how the team has come to its judgments, mm -hmm. maybe not necessarily going into the work papers for the broader set, but how the team has come to its judgments and how, how those have been articulated in the audit report, uh, I mean, in all cases, seem like something prudent. So we're having folks in our professional practice group very similar go through that exercise with the, the majority of, large, vast majority of our larger seven and father group. One of the things I know we've also done, in addition to what you all mentioned, in terms of the, the QC around it, so whether it's the, the national office, the signing partner, the EQR, uh, as we've recently implemented a consultation policy if you don't have a CAM, okay? So if you have an engagement and the team has concluded there's not a critical audit matter, uh, we're requiring a formal consultation just so we can have the right conversations and make sure that we're getting the right answer. We, we've, we've got that and we've added um, a, a near side consultation if you only have one, just to make sure. Okay. Because uh, we quickly find out zero becomes one quite quickly. And then we step one to the right, and if anybody in the chain of command or the team or the parties think there's a close call, uh, there's a single point national consultation requirement on that, which is designed in those spots where professionals have this view and they're all circling an issue, and they just can't come to a, a, an agreed position to make sure they get out of the engagement and have somebody else looking and going through and saying, as a close call matter, is this or is this not a CAM that we as an organization would say, yep, yeah, that's the way we go. Mark, I'll just observe that the board um, in adopting the standard was very deliberate about building in kind of foundational steps or requirements that would support the firm's individual quality control systems around implementation. Um, the, the very uh, decision-making process itself of identifying a CAM um, was deliberately thought through to, uh, to be able to track that in, in practice. And then the requirement for documentation around what, determining what is a CAM and what were properly communicated in the EQR review were all kind of foundational steps to support a quality control system for implementation. Very good. Jen, now that we're through, not through, now that we're into this large tranche, of, of June 30 uh, year ends with large accelerative, large accelerative filers. Any other observations? What types of questions are you getting from your teams, whether it's relative to the actual critical audit matter or the auditor's response to it? Anything else come to mind um, as you're kind of going through this on a real-time basis right now? Um, I think we're all really happy we did the dry runs as robustly as we did because it, you know, it feels like that was a great dress rehearsal for the final performance. You know, there haven't been a lot of now that we've gone live hiccups, I think having walked all of the constituencies through it, you know, it gives us a chance to re really revisit what, we, what did we communicate to the audit committee? You know, was that clear and crisp? What was our decision-making process? And now getting them down in writing. Like I said, I'm sure um, as, as more get written and as we see more and as, um, you know, I'm sure we're doing, uh, we are doing it ourselves, I'm sure others are doing it, kind of taking a look at the cams as a whole that are out there. Um, you know, how can we refine the words? Is there, is there a way of even adding greater clarification to what we're trying to communicate? And as you see more examples in practice, I'm sure 
we'll continue to evolve that. I think one other item, which I should have mentioned before, was um, another benefit of the dry runs, and I think Josh, you mentioned it, was the cam, the cams with a K and, cam and cams with a C. And as we get into dual registrants um, and how that works, really from a reporting basis, um, you know, in the spirit of principle, we've gotten to the point where we think K cams and C cams are pretty close. The rules are different, and mm -hmm. you need to be really sensitive to that. But I think we'll also see how that evolves in practice too. And I know there's at least one report out. Um, so far that had, that, that was an FPI that had K cams and C cams. Yeah, you get five K cams, I think, and three C cams in that, in yeah. that specific example. So, so we'll see, you know, see, see where that practice uh, evolves as well. Okay, very good. Abe, uh, you know, you, you talked about the, the, the board of PCMB support um, of the profession as you went through this, and, and I know in the guidance that was issued in March, um, you talked about uh, the engagement you had with 10 firms in terms of methodologies and in, in terms of understanding where they're at in their process. Can you provide some more color on some of the themes that came out of that work with, with uh, some of the 10 firms? Yeah, so um, as part of being a more pr a preventive focused uh, implementation effort of the board, um, uh, we were happy to engage with the firms as they prepared and went through the dry runs and we uh, had discussions with 10 firms who uh, audit, I think, by 85% of the largest accelerated filers. Um, and we, through a, a multi-divisional uh, working group within the PCOB, received the firm's methodology, some training materials, and other guidance, and reviewed those, not for the purpose of providing any assurance over them or giving any opinions on them, but really for understanding uh, how, how the firms were implementing the requirements, um, identifying if there are any issues we saw in, in the methodologies themselves, um, and went through a very structured review process and provided feedback to the firms uh, on our observations. Uh, and overall, I think we identified that most of the methodologies were consistent with the standards. We provided a couple of obser observations, which uh, as you mentioned are uh, disclosed in a summary of, of this on our website. Um, for example, uh, as Josh mentioned earlier, the PCAB had issued some guidance on factors for auditors to consider in determining whether a matter is uh, complex or challenging or subjective. Um, the guidance in the standard actually points to six factors, but then has, I guess what I can refer to as a catch-all. Uh, and some firm methodologies didn't reflect the catch-all, so they just kind of listed six things and it seemed to end it at that point. And so we just observed that you should encourage your engagement teams to think about the catch-all. There might be other factors specific to the audit uh, that you should consider in your, in your implementation uh, and on um, determining what is a CAM. Uh, so overall, I think it was the, uh, helpful to share the observations. Um, our hope was other firms would benefit from uh, the observations and the experience and just the knowledge sharing uh, so they could have a more effective implementation as well. Any observations on Abe's comments about the benefits to your firms uh, through that specific process? Well, I would compliment the, the current board on being true to their promise. When, when the board came in, there was a promise to be more open to interaction. Um, and this, I think, was the first time we had a situation where the board would actually come and look at a methodology pre-implementation and provide commentary, uh, with all of the caveats, but nonetheless commentary on it um, and then provide a public report out for firms that they didn't look at. And, and that, that piece of activity is very helpful for firms when you're trying to implement standards in good faith and you also know there's an inspection process coming and you're trying to make sure you're ahead of both those activities. Uh, this was helpful. It, it, it gave a degree of perspective and spots where things can be refined. Uh, and I would just hope that uh, as we continue, the board continues to to spend more time in those activities because it does lead to better certainty in knowing what's been expected and how we can implement. Yeah, I mean, I'd just add on to that. I mean, I think the opportunity, one, to interact maybe as a firm with the PCOB's um, inspection group but others on our specific methodology, but the opportunity to interact with the PCOB through the, through the CAQ was, was really helpful. I mean, I think the opportunity to bring kind of practice issues up, up and kind of get a, have a two-way dialogue around, you know, what we were seeing, kind of some of what those challenges were, what we thought, you know, maybe reasonable points of view were, and to have that, that back and forth was incredibly helpful um, 
you know, to, to, for, for us in terms of whether or not we were thinking about it the right way, but you know, it's obviously this is a big change. Everyone wants to get it right. Um, and so having that opportunity to have that back and forth was, was tremendously helpful. Very much appreciated. Yeah, I would echo what Philip and Josh said. And, and you know, of all of the subject matters more than any others, since this is public disclosure, right, to, to have seek some, got enough guidance to make it consistent across. I mean, if you did this for an execution type of standard, we'd all still reap the same benefits, but it would be really internal in our audit documentation mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But for something that's going to the public, to all of the investors and other stakeholders to have that level of engagement, I think will pay dividends in the end as we, as we see these rolling out. Jim, maybe just uh, you know, moving to audit committee discussions and disclosures. If you think about the CAMs, you know, theoretically, anything disclosed as critical audit matter would have been disclosed um, previously to the audit committee. How does the expanded reporting model influence that dialogue with audit committees? How do you see that playing out? I think that we have found it to be um, great. It has, it has not, I think there was a concern, maybe back to your first question of what were people concerned about during mm -hmm. the comment letter process, that would it chill um, communications with auditor committees to begin with, and I actually think the opposite. I think everybody, all of the participants have really engaged and embraced the process, um, in part because you know, audit committees and management want to know what are you going to say about me, but I, I think just trying to get to the spirit of it, so then making sure your audit committee communications are clear, complete, um, et cetera, has been a, a great exercise. Um, so I, we've had a lot of positivity arising from it just to, it, it helps you engage in more dialogue with the audit committee and that's, that's always a great outcome. I think very specifically as Jen describes that, because the audit committee knows where the audit's gonna progress and the potential disclosure, they draw more specific information out of the auditor earlier. So you can imagine earlier in the audit somebody says, oh, there's a significant risk of material misstatement related to the potential impairment of goodwill at the company due to changing in economic conditions. And the audit committee says, all right, so tell me specifically what you're thinking about because we'd like to know because they know at the end of the sequence, um, the things that challenge the audit are the things that they need to be attentive to, so there's a benefit there, and those are the things that are like going to be disclosed in the audit report. There's a real kind of um, triangulation of governance interest that occurs as a consequence and helps draws auditors into being more specific about what they're communicating to the audit committee. Yeah, you're continuing with the theme of, of uh, proactive uh, facilitation and wide-scale implementation. Can you speak to some of the other things um, the PCOB has been doing as you think about you know, again, trying to get out in front of this and working with the firms? Part of the, the uh, new standard being effective because it involves investors and audit committees and the audit firms themselves, uh, the board really wanted to engage with all those stakeholders. So uh, as part of this multi-divisional uh, working group, uh, our external affairs office is really heading up an effort to um, engage all the, all the different stakeholder groups through various meetings, uh, participating in conferences, we've published uh, webinars, uh, and uh, publishing materials uh, on, uh, on the, the CAM requirements. Uh, so you may have seen on our website, we have a number of different documents, resources for audit committees, resources for investors, uh, guidance documents, staff guidance documents, those kinds of tools where we really try to boil down um, the 150 page rulemaking release uh, and the issues described in that, down to just a few pages of relatively plain English, what audit committee members or investors and others should think about and what they should be concerned about uh, or think uh, or be aware of as they go through this process. Um, so uh, a number of effort, efforts underway, th those continue, uh, and we hope to replicate that with other standards projects going forward as well. And as you think about some of the, the, the lessons learned from your dry runs, Jen, Josh, and Philip, um, the types of challenges that you're facing and have faced. Uh, what type of input did you provide to the PCOB in that regard? Can you maybe share your thoughts in that regard? Anything specific that came up that would play into what Abe's described? I think what has helped considerably is the, the board has tasked people with that outreach. Uh, so in our monthly uh, meetings with the PCOB's Division of Inspections, we actually address CAM up front. There's a team that comes and they want to hear and they want to ask. That's, that's a pretty critical part of this because it opens the space for the dialogue 
to happen in a disciplined way. And I just encourage the board to continue to do that. Task people with asking and giving feedback within the board structures, it creates the conversation, which then means the firms are being very deliberate in thinking through what they want to bring to the table. That was, to us, I think, a huge enabler. Yeah. No, and I think you're just speaking to some of the things that, that were talked about as part of some of our discussions. I think the nice thing was, you know, I talked to earlier about the benefit of those discussions to us. I think many of, many if not most of those topics that were brought up were, have been addressed in subsequent PCOB kind of guidance documents and things like that. And so, you know, one of the topics we spent a fair bit of time talking about is kind of the relationship between a company's critical accounting estimates and CAMs. You know, I think that's an area where certainly investors have commented and, you know, as we've interacted with our teams, you know, how our teams think through um, evaluating matters that are identified as critical accounting estimates as CAMs, kind of what's driving decisions around what is or is not a CAM, and then, and what's, you know, what's, what's quite frankly been some interesting discussions between our teams and the company around how they think about the SEC's requirements around critical accounting estimates and how that correlates to some of our judgments and some of the conversations we've been having with the company around, hey, look, you know, you know here's how we think through these issues, you know, here's how we understand the SEC's you know, intent for the critical accounting estimates have, you know, is, are, are we, you know, is there some rethinking we should do around how we, uh, how we, um, how we think about it from an audit perspective or how the company thinks about it from a disclosure perspective around how they characterize those and talk about those. And so I think there's been some interesting discussions beyond just the CAM process that I think providing, you know, some of that perspective during these meetings helped everyone kind of appreciate kind of the impact it's having um, and made us, I think, feel better about our thought process, but as well as, I'm, I'm sure hopefully um, the piece should be found interesting to understand how some of that dialogue's going, and I know um, hopefully the SEC will find that interesting as, as well. <laughs> yeah, I would just um, add, I think, I think the bottom line is, is the ongoing nature of the dialogue. So whether it was through the CAQ work or whether it's now um, you know, at a firm level with, with the inspections team, it's just continuing the dialogue. Someone mentioned this, earl this earlier. Um, about when a standard comes out, everybody sort of interprets what they think the words mean. Mm -hmm. And I think this easily could have been a standard that came out and then we would individually each try to interpret what it meant and wound up in a really different place. Having the opportunity at each of the major milestones throughout to get together in various ways and then to have the PCAOB actually issue really helpful guidance um, that was clarifying but not limiting in terms of trying to meet the, the spirit of the standard was fantastic. Um, we could have just left it here and then we'd probably all see a lot more inconsistency than we're gonna end up with, which I think is great. Well, our objective really is to, to have, the, have the standard effectively implemented by the firms. And so whether it's receiving information about the dry runs uh, from the firms through the CAQ or our inspectors um, um, or chief auditor's office meeting individually with the firms to understand um, what they're doing and provide some feedback. Um, we learn a lot. Um, it also helps us work together more effectively as, uh, as a group. Um, this is this pre-implementation or pre-effective date process provided a new opportunity for the PCAB. We get to um, experience a little change management ourselves um, and implement a new process. Um, and the, I think the outcome of that was reflected in some of the guidance documents we call the deeper dive documents you've seen on our website where we answered some questions. So we had a number of questions come in through the discussions about the, the dry runs, a number of questions come in from individual firms or engagement with them, with the inspections teams. Um, and to, to get those questions and then share that publicly so others can benefit from it, we think will be effective in, um, in implementing it in the standard. Yeah, just tremendous ongoing collaboration. Hopefully, again, you're all getting a sense of that as many of you have been living this for some time now. I think this, uh, this has been uh, tremendous in terms of getting us to a better place. Um, you know, Philip, let's, let's now turn to implementation. We've touched on this a little bit in terms of what we're doing to get our engagement teams ready. Can you speak to some of the things that BDO has been doing with respect to training, guidance, methodology, and enab enablement, anything come to mind that you think is particularly relevant? Yeah, so I, I draw back on some of the stuff we've mentioned. Yeah, clearly building the methodology is important. Uh, having a tool set, in, in our case, uh, we have a, a tool set that requires a very clinical recording of communications with the audit committee. So you have tabulation, and then a very left to right step through the judgment gates that are in the standard. Um, making sure that the training is mandatory, so we've pushed that down several levels 
in the organization. Making sure we've got subject matter experts. In our case, we're doing it for at least the next two years. We'll then reassess, walking alongside every CAM development. And I, I always try to frame it this way. You think about the audit report as the reporting phase of the audit. But actually, this standard is a standard that walks alongside the communications with the audit committee. Uh, so we have a lot of um, time spent on every communication moment to make sure engagement teams are tabulating and thinking through those communications and that they then walk through the life cycle of what might have been a more important item at Q2, less important at Q4, less important item at Q2, more important at Q4. So by the time you get to the end, they're presenting draft CAMs as early as the November, so Q3 of the audit cycle. They're actually saying at this point in time, here are the CAM candidates we think are likely, and these are the kind of things we think we're heading towards. Clearly, we'll recalibrate as we round out. But that's a, a very different drafting phase, to your point earlier, compared to I do the audit. Uh, I need an audit report. A, B, C, A, and off I go. So that, that's part of the, the process we've gotten. And we are going to keep subject matter experts in, in place for a while, because we think there's a behavioral change that needs to be embedded and repeated until we're comfortable to take that away and, and see how people can execute. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, you know, similar observations that we've been noticed. I think, you know, going back to your, your, your discussion about audit committee communications, I think, you know, making sure, I guess, one of the challenges we observed is we have multiple touch points with the audit committee from throughout the year and making sure we consider all of those threads from throughout the year when we're evaluating um, CAMs, not only for, for one, to kind of comply with obviously the documentation standard within the, within the standard itself, but to make sure we're being pretty comprehensive in our thinking around what are the touch points, what have been the significant matters that, that we've deemed important to the audit committee during the year, even though it may have been much earlier in the year than what, what we've done at the heat of the battle um, at year end has, has been very important. And so trying to find ways to make sure we capture that and memorialize that has been something we focused on a lot. Um, another thing that you know, we, we observed, I guess, and it's in our, through our interactions with companies and the teams is everyone wants to know how everybody else is doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so everyone wants to know how did my cams compare to, you know, my competitor, um, to industry trends and things like that. And, you know, we, we talk about that a lot as a firm um, because obviously, you know, there's, you know, probably there's a presumption that you have a cam, but but there's not a presumption around what those CAMs should be, right? And so we, we want to make sure and we encourage, obviously, a reflection within that specific audit around matters that raise to that, to that level. But at the same time, you know, I think audit committees, management are, you know, asking for that information. So spending time within an organization, just kind of understanding maybe what some of those trends are and, and helping our teams understand, hey, look, that's information that's you know, useful, might be useful to them as they think through how they've thought about matters they've addressed in the audit, um, but presented in a way that doesn't, you know, create some kind of presumption around certain matters being CAMs commonly. Um, that's not to say that you won't probably see some CAMs consistently in certain industries, but, you know, careful balance between understanding what maybe some of those trends are to help facilitate, you know, teams thinking about that, as well as addressing what we think are, you know, probably reasonable questions from audit committees around, you know, let me understand how you came to your judgments in your particular audit um, based on what you know about our business and maybe just thematically what might be other issues that are resident in my industry, I think is a probably a helpful dialogue, not only from a risk assessment and audits planning and strategy discussion and then from the audit committee's oversight of the audit process, but we've seen that's been something that um, certainly we get a lot of questions about and we spend a lot of efforts um, trying to help, uh, help um, our teams that think about that, think through that and do that in a way that's, that's obviously constructive without creating you know, kind of a bunch of presumptions. And it sounds like from the panel this morning, they touched on this, on the phased in implementation. It sounds like this was certainly welcome in this case in, in terms of the, the timeline. Can anybody shed well, some light on that? I think unlike the panel this morning, we don't have any skunk works going around to try and use the phased in to make an exception at the back end. So maybe that helps. I thought the phased in was great. Uh, you know, the, it, it really allowed us all to grow. We, we started with, a template to capture everything a year ago that we've just refined over time with experience in the dry runs, guidance from the PCOB being issued, learning experiences, and so we're, we'll continue to do that. Um, you know, I don't know if every standard needs a phase in, but this one sure did, and so I'm glad it worked out that way. Yeah, no, it's been interesting. It's, it's been great, but at the same time, 
you know, those June to September year ends are used to going last. And so the idea of them going <laughs> first has made for some interesting it's so interesting. discussions. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh man, how can we? <laughs> and so. It's a whole different perspective. Exactly. Well, I'd far rather it's the junior ends going first if but we do have a choice. Right. right. Smaller <laughs> population. Before we get into Q&A, um, I mentioned this at the outset. I, let, let's take just a couple of minutes and talk about the academic community. Um, given the significance of what we're all talking about up here, this does just seem ripe for research. Um, can you, any, you give your thoughts on, on ways you think that um, the academic community can contribute? Well, I'll just mention one thing that we're doing. One of the benefits of having a fees in here is after the uh, large accelerated filers uh, file all their audit reports with CAMS or no CAMS. Uh, we plan to do what we're calling an interim analysis, uh, evaluating those uh, filings uh, and providing a public report, um, hopefully close to the end of 2020, um, to share kind of our, our insights on you know, what we saw, what happened, our experience with uh, overseeing the firms and how, uh, how these were received. Um, and that presents a number of interesting questions as we plan to move then into a post-implementation review uh, after the full effective date uh, a couple of years down the road. We've been thinking about what, kind of, what are the research questions we, we can study, what data will we have, what's appropriate for an interim analysis versus a long-term post-implementation review. And this is, I think, an area where um, academics who are trained in this, um, in this skill can really uh, identify and share ideas about uh, researchable questions and data sources and research techniques and, as well. I, I, I agree completely and if I think about specific questions for next year, finding out on large set of filers, did investors change their behavior and begin to read the audit report would seem to be, to be a really interesting question. Good place to start. <laughs> uh, and it's a pretty easy one that can be done in the early phase. Um, these, I found people don't read the audit report all that often, but maybe that, that's a, a question we could ask. Uh, there could be questions around if they did read the audit report, did it change investor behaviors? Uh, did it change the way they viewed the financial statements? Did it change the allocation of capital? Uh, did it cause them to ask different questions around board structure? Did it change the way analysts viewed the company? I think those are two pretty interesting questions if you had to ask me uh, on the high my list are things academics could get behind and could get behind next year. We don't have to wait for a very long period of time, which some other studies will need. That's something that could be kicked off in March next year with a pretty credible body of reports, investors, and people to investigate around. I, I agree with Philip on the, um, you know, just simply did it serve its purpose, which was to, to provide additional useful information. And so, you know, how can we measure and figure out whether that, that actually happened? I think the perspective of the audit committee, you know, has there, has, has there been any audit committee behavior change arising from CAMS? And if so, what was that? I, I do think the KCAM, CCAM question is still an interesting one to pursue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there's lots, lots of interesting topics. Yeah, CAMS, the critical accounting policies. CAMS, uh, critical, yeah. yeah. And as you said that, Jen, it triggered a thought of perhaps this is another spot, and there, there are some, I think, here in, in this audience who do this kind of research. Does the presence of more information in the audit report enhance the view of people coming into the profession of the value of what we do? Does a more informative audit report create in the thousands of people who do audit work a sense that what I do matters? Yeah, I think there's industry stuff. Does it turn out people actually would like to see something that, would they lean more towards the boilerplate to get industry standards versus to continue to get really unique to the entity information? And wh where, what it, where does that balance end up? Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, building on those, I think, you know, getting perspective, again, obviously the theme is understanding how this is becoming informative to users. It'd be interesting to see what kind, if you're a company, kind of what, how does the CAM, just, just the disclosure, the inclusion of CAMs in the audit report kind of, what kind of questions have come out to companies around the financial statements and the disclosures kind of correlating off of, I mean, certainly the bulk of the CAM disclosure is over the audit and what the audit did in response, but you know, part of this was to Dave's point earlier to give them more insights into the financial statements. So how are they using those and is, is an output of that any, any different questions with respect to how they're analyzing the financial statements and what are they doing to make, to make their decisions as part of that analysis? So certainly no shortage of ideas there and I think there's probably gonna be much more to come. So I'm glad we're all here together today to have 
to have this conversation. Margo, hopefully we've got some, some good questions. The floor is yours, Margo. This is just follow on to, to your research comments. I think what you guys have talked about is a lot about archivalists, and this is rich for archival research. I've received a couple questions about behavioralists and who they want to talk to. And I think it's important they hear from you in terms of who are the decision makers on these CAMs when, we, when you're all dealing with that. Sure. Uh, so Dan, I'll, I'll give you just on our, on, our, on our sense, what we've seen is you start off inside the firm that the engagement partner has a highly influential position in taking the initial point of view. Uh, so when you talk about creating anchoring or confirmation biases, risks, the engagement partner is going to sit and say, I think this is or is not something that's a CAM. Uh, that creates some interesting behavioral questions because now you've got to wonder about whether the EQR looking at it uh, is going to be so influenced by that first decision, are they going to create the check and balance challenge? And then you've got the firm's infrastructure, uh, whether it's a risk management lens which wants more CAMs, or it's a risk management lens that wants less, or it's somebody who wants to reshape how you describe the CAM. That, that was things, the next behavioral thing inside the firm. And then you get the management audit committee, and, and I would just pass the observation, yeah, we're dealing with large accelerated filers. These are measured, sophisticated boards. Uh, they think in a different fashion. We still have the next round to come. And I think the further we get down the market capitalization, the less sophisticated boards may react differently. But the audit committee, management's willingness to accept a matter. Um, we had a client in the early discussion around this say, so when does my general counsel get the opportunity to review and comment on your proposed audit report? Which was often a rather amusing description of it, is our report, so no, you're not, you're not going to get a chance to do that. Um, so you will get those kind of behavioral things. And then the market, I, I, I guess the market's going to react. It's going to react behaviorally to what people experience in the inspection process. It's going to be react to what litigators try and do. Um, so all of that, I think, Dan, fits into that behavioral piece. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, just to your point, I think, you know, the, the partner in charge in the EQR, I mean, the partner in charge is going to have the primary responsibility these first couple of years. There's going to be a lot of folks weighing in to help kind of everybody manage through the process. So it's probably a little bit of a unique environment the first few years as everyone's kind mm -hmm. of feeling their way through it. But, but, but certainly, first and foremost, is, is the, the partner in charge of the engagement. Yeah, Philip pretty much named just about everybody in the process. <laughs> yeah. I think that was a filibuster. <laughs> well, you know, we sit at the research advisory board, which is why Dan asked this question. People say, we, well, how, can we re how can we find behavior? I said, well, just find all the people involved. But generally, the senior doesn't make the decision. That's right. That's right. Okay. Philip, I interpreted one of your early comments as suggesting you thought there could be an uh, expectations gap between what investors expected to be able to do with the information and what the information would actually enable them to do. So as you've gone through this process, what has been your thoughts on what investors expect to be able to do with the camps? I, so the, 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 if I start at the front end, the audit committees expect less was where we started. They've matured up and I think they're now more balanced. I think investors expect more. So I think investors just coming at this are going to look at the auditor's report and say, what does it tell me that I otherwise didn't know? And in many cases, it's going to point them to where the company places emphasis. And then there may be, I don't know if there will be, but there may be investors who say, I think the auditor could have told me more, and I'm wondering why they didn't tell me more. So that's the kind of uh, inevitable question of, we're trying to be more informative, but the market may actually expect the information to be even more informative than what we give. Um, can I ask a question that sort of builds on this, but gets it down to much more of a pragmatic level? And I, I realize there's not enough of these CAM disclosures yet to um, you, you probably don't have any experience with how, how, what questions are arising from investors and the media with respect to the specificity of what's being said. Um, so you probably don't have any experience yet on how these are getting answered. Um, but when they do ask these questions, I assume you're going to refer them to the company, probably investor relations or something. Could, could you talk a little bit about how it's going, you expect it to, what kinds of questions will come up you know, 
from specifically for a company and who's going to answer those questions? How will they get answered? Thank you. You, you always like to bring the impossible question early on. <laughs> I would say this, there were, what were we at last week? Six of these in the marketplace, so bear that in mind. Uh, of the six, I think five of them had uncertain tax positions in. Mm -hmm. So I think we pick uncertain tax positions just for the sake of us responding theoretically, because at least then we're not attributing to any entity. Um, I would guess investors may look at an uncertain tax position disclosure by the auditor and say, did that tell me something new? If your matter of judgment happens to be around certain structures, what were those structures? Where were those structures? How did the company come about them? I expect that some of the question we might see them try ask. We will deflect them back to the company, but I could see them asking those questions. Yeah, I think I think certainly to the expect investors are looking that they read the CAM description, particularly why the matter is complex. I would expect they, they might ask questions of the company. Will help, you know, what was what was particularly challenging about this particular couple aspects as you developed, you know, as I read your disclosure and everything else. So you would expect the company to be prepared to talk maybe, you know, it's an interesting dynamic to know how, how many, what types of questions might come in and how much the company can say beyond what's in the financial statements for fear of Reg FD and other issues as well. Um, another interesting part is whether we'll start getting, whether investors might ask questions of, well, help me understand how you audited that area beyond just the, the paragraph. and. And certainly, you know, I guess, you know, uh, you know, whether they'll be looking for more discussion of procedures and things like that is anybody's, anybody's guess. We haven't heretofore had a venue where auditors have had outside of maybe a, occasional question when you get it when you attend the shareholders meeting <laughs> um, where we've had those, any, any direct line of communications. And so I think, you know, we haven't had those questions come yet. We're working through internally how we might deal with those if they were to come up and making sure we involve you know, all of the relevant parties internally to think about what's the best approach if those questions were to, were to come in. So Josh, yeah. this would be a question that says, fine, I understand the company's UTP was complex, now tell me more about your audit procedures. Right. Which locations did you visit, and when right. you were there, mm -hmm. what questions did you ask, what evidential matter did you get? Uh, I can imagine we will all be squirming our way through, um, pointing right. out that we don't want to give details of the company's position through our answers. I think it's a great question. Yeah. See how we'll see where it goes. Much more to come. Much more to come. Just from a limited sample, what we had investor relations to ask some questions. I was going to ask a little bit about uh, your estimate of the cost of doing this and how that's being factored into your engagement uh, planning, and how does that compare with what the PCOB did in their economic analysis in terms of estimating the cost of the implementing this rule? We're all trying to work out who's going to take the hot <laughs> potato. Um, it cost more than people expected. Let's start with that. Um, so whatever expectation you had, it's more than that. Uh, you just have to think about an audit committee. And if you have five communication moments in the year, and that's probably on the low side, it's probably more than that. You say for each moment, there is a thoughtfulness here about inventorying the communication, aligning it to the audit work, watch how the audit work developed, come back and recheck, then going through the judgment process, having the EQR go through that, having the subject matter experts look at it, and then starting to frame the wording. It doesn't take you too long, too long, to model out and know that this is going to land in a 60, 100, 120 hour range on a reasonable audit with complexity without a lot of challenging moments in it. And it'll probably go up from there. And it's also true that this is all experienced time. So you're talking about cost points that are not on the lower end. This is not a leverageable moment. You can't go and find uh, graduates as well as you guys educate the graduates. You can't take a first year graduate and say, could you please help me develop the thinking? So you can take that and model it. Uh, you'll find some it will be more. You'll find some it might be less. Over time it will settle. But um, I don't think those assumptions are unreasonable with what we know now. So there, I've put myself out there. Let's see if there's any agreement with that direction. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, it, it, it's it's not no time, right? I think you know, going through the process. I think as we've seen, you know, I think you know, it, it, the more complex the company's environment is, the more you know, critical accounting estimates that are included in the report, right? I think the more, you know, maybe challenging accounting judgments the companies make. Obviously, the time you know it takes to to go through and reconcile those, um, and go through all the the judgment 
process, document those, and then, you know, as we talked about, you guys have heard a lot, you know, the implementation process, you know, has been going on for a couple of years, right? And so you see certainly once, as teams get more comfortable, that process becomes a, a, a little more routine, but, but it, it takes time to, to go through and, and again, to make sure, you know, the, the critical accounting matter doesn't have to just be the, the full account, right? It can be components. And so making sure you're really considering, right, thoughtfully the, the, the nature of the communications, what was important, how you went about it, you know, all that takes, takes time. And, and certainly, um, you know, given it's the audit report, given again, it's the one product we have, that's something that obviously the most experienced people on the team have to weigh in on. They're the ones setting the audit strategy and everything else. And so it's, um, we certainly have seen you know, benefits over the amount of time it takes in the second year versus, you know, for the, for the June 30th versus the first year with the dry run, but it's, um, but it's certainly more challenging than I think some of our teams anticipated going in, where they thought they could, you know, kind of come up with it kind of toward the end of the audit and whip it out. <laughs> yeah, it's not inconsequential. I think adding quality reviewers and other approaches in the early years also adds to it. I think it does remain to be seen how the marketplace response, you know, you might say, well, it's indicative that it will just tail off as everybody becomes more used to it. But if the marketplace says, hey, I think four camps is a great place, or, you know, to Philip's earlier somewhat cynical point about, you know, lawsuits in the, in the hindsight is 2020 on what you didn't disclose in a cam, you know, what will that drive? And, and I think those are unknowns. All undetermined at this point. All undetermined, yeah. I'll, I'll just add that um, these are all the kinds of questions that we're thinking about in our, uh, from our economic analysis point of view, uh, either the interim analysis or long term, the post implementation review. Um, how do you uh, identify and measure costs? How do you identify and measure behavioral changes um, and other benefits? And you know, we're thinking through the different data sources. We're in discussions with the firms about different data um, gathering techniques we can use whether we can use surveys uh, of investors and audit committees and others to try to put together ways to test all, all, these, uh, all these questions. Hi, so I was uh, gonna ask a question. I know we know a lot, from both academic research and in practice, about issues that come up during the audit as far as misstatement and those interactions between auditors and clients, and we know a little bit less about those interactions with respect to ICFR. And now I assume we know much, 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 much less about those interactions for CAMs. Right? And so from the limited amount of camera that we've seen so far, can you talk a little bit about the, what you've seen as far as just day-to-day -day on the ground interaction about when something's been identified as maybe a potential cam or not and how that, that process differs um, or is similar to some of the conversation you'd have about maybe an ICFR issue or even a misstatement? You, you mean in terms of the interactions between the audit team and the company around those Correct. matters? Correct, yes. So I mean, I think, you know, I think, Philip, you'd articulate this process a little bit. So I guess from our perspective, you know, we, encourage our teams to think about as part of the planning process, what are those areas that could be potential candidates to be CAMs, right? So thinking about as you're going into planning the audit, hey, look, here are some areas that present themselves higher risk because of the level of subjectivity, level of complexity, whatever. Let's talk about what, the, what those matters could be CAMs, and let's, let's have that discussion as part of the planning process. Um, and then as we kind of finish the planning process, make our way through, through interim, you know, let's, let's put a finer point on those and use that as a discussion point with management as part of maybe the overall audit plan or as maybe as part of an interim, interim discussion um, about, hey, here are the matters that we're contemplating, you know, from a CAM perspective. And, you know, you use it, we've tried to encourage it to be used as an opportunity to really put a finer point on some of the broader aspects of the audit planning process that we've already been communicating. You know, if you talk about, you know, a goodwill impairment analysis, right, it's, you know, there might be some reporting units that are particularly challenging relative to others. And so you would expect perhaps a CAM to be anchored off of maybe the analysis of a reporting unit. So using that kind of thought process to really anchor a discussion with the audit committee that says, hey, we're, this, this whole analysis is really important because goodwill is really big, right? But for these, these two areas, it's, it might be kind of sticky as we go through the audit process. So we're gonna have a lot of emphasis on those two areas. And those two areas might be something we call out as a CAM, right? And so having those kind of discussions can really help put a finer point on the audit strategy. And then we've, similar to sounds like, you know, Phil, what you guys have done is we've kind of required our teams to kind of put a interim stake in the ground in connection kind of roughly with their third quarter review. So companies have an understanding of, hey, look, here's, if we were in the audit today, here's kind of where we'd be and here's kind of what we'd say. So you can start planning for any potential discussions that, that might come up. So there aren't any kind of surprises from that end. And then, you know, if anything happens between that November timeframe and, and February, you have a process to update it. Um, 
the benefit of that not only is to encourage some of that discussion, it also has some impact, benefit from our system of quality control because we can get through some of those control issue, control checks and things like that in a, you can imagine reviewing 500 larger cellular filer audit reports in January, February is probably not the most conducive to answering lots of other questions, right? And so trying to use that as an opportunity, not only to give our clients opportunities to react, but give our system of quality control the benefit of that timetable has been, been really important. And so it's been very helpful from that, from that discussion. I think companies have really appreciated having that visibility um, and it's really helped promote, you know, some maybe some finer audit strategy discussion aspects along the way. I just want to come back. I, I agree with your PD, Josh. We just made CAMs proximate to misstatements and control weaknesses. That's the same kind of moment we've had to walk teams back on and, and that makes us different because a, an ICFR issue is a defect. So when a company has a discussion with an auditor about a potential material weakness, you know, deficiency, that's a defect on their side. Their reaction to that should be accordingly quite strong because they have to make sure they have a defect. If there's a misstatement, it's their accounts that are wrong. Distinguishing these CAMs and helping everybody in the market understand this is just an indication of where the auditor spent time and found it was a more significant subjective complex matter, uh, that's going to be a big shift because if people treat this with the same proximity as a quantification, an emphasis, a defect, you get a, 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 you get a different kind of interaction. So. I think that's a really important point. This might be an urban legend, but I, I heard a tale of someone who said, okay, great, we got three cams this year. Let's, next year, let's shoot for zero, because they do see it as a, you know, as, as a, a goal to achieve versus, as Philip said, it's, it's just trying to provide greater transparency. But I think because it is so new after you know, the same report and very limited information, it's just going to take a little bit of time to get that mindset change. Uh, my question is a follow-up in some respects on something Philip said, but then also perhaps a, a more general question. I'm wondering if the complexity behind the CAMs has already been priced in the audit fee, or are we going to see changes in hours? Are we going to see changes in the mix of the uh, folks on the audit uh, engagement as a consequence of the uh, new standard? If I, if I pay back the question, I think the, the, it, it's not about the additional time on the CAM. That's this side. It's if in looking at critical audit matters, is it possible that because the audit committee and the auditor now talk about it in more depth, your goodwill example going down to the reporting unit, could that drive in some audits additional attention in the field work? I think it's possible. Um, I'm not sitting here well, knowing it well, but I think it's possible. If that means involving a specialist, for example, that, you sure. know, that perhaps there's a specialist spending more time to look at an issue more deeply, it, I think it could be. So is it, would it be reasonable to say that you wouldn't be surprised if there were an increase in uh, audit fees due to the, the standard? I think, the, I think I wouldn't be surprised if there's an increase in audit effort. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, all right, it's interesting because I think as you know, in theory, right, the CAM determination process is supposed to be an output of the audit strategy de determination process, right? So when we talk about effort, there's obviously an effort to go through and evaluate which matters you did in the audit or CAMs. It's interesting to think about, I guess, maybe some of those other kind of things that could come up along the way, because the determination process is supposed to be based off how you've assessed risk and how you've gone about executing the audit, right? So it becomes a little bit, a little circular, right, if you start changing that plan because you think it might be a cam and so I you know it's it's a little bit I can't say that I've seen that kind of discussion come up yet I mean certainly you want to make sure the determination process is consistent with how you viewed risk and how you've executed the audit right but I don't I can be honest and I in my discussions with teams no one said well I have a cam I need to go back and involve maybe a specialist yeah. to make sure I audited the cam the right way I, I, because I, I think that's right Josh so. I, I can also and again we deal with a large accelerated filers at the moment so we are at the more sophisticated end so this is going to become a little predictive about the less sophisticated end. I could see some audit committees as we move through market sophistication saying, hang on, now I understand what you're concerned about as an auditor. I want to get more information about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to have more attention. I, I could see that happening as, yeah. we, as we kind of move further along this, this continuum. Yeah. I think it's a great question. I think it's one of these that's going to play out over time, you could certainly see the tendency in some cases to rethink the mix 
not redo your entire audit approach, but I think all these questions are going to come up in maybe a year or two into this before the market has a chance to react to it, and certainly as we have conversations with our clients in that regard. So I have a question as well, and, and Abe, if you'll indulge me, it's a question specifically for you. Just reflecting on this discussion and having repeatedly heard the enthusiasm from your fellow panelists on the approach undertaken in promulgating CAM standard setting, as opposed to how it's been done in the past, and the, the highly collaborative, very uh, interactive, the sharing of information, the review of the methodology, and ultimately that common objective of having the standard implemented effectively from the outset. I, I know it's still early days, and we haven't seen much in the way of CAM reporting as yet, but I'm curious as to uh, whether the PCOB has experienced enough of maybe this different approach to implementing standards, uh, to setting and then implementing standards, that you would have a view as to whether this would be more of the, the approach going forward, um, more of uh, you know the sharing, the interactive, the uh, as well as the uh, informing some of the phasing and type type timing decisions, etc. So I don't know if you've got a perspective on that. Yeah. So I would say the results have yet to be seen um, in w what the ultimate outcome is in terms of the CAMs themselves and how. Uh, our inspections and other oversight activities uh, learn about the Im implementation. But I think there are a number of things that we've, uh, benefits that we've seen already from this different approach. Part of that is um, more effective sharing of, uh, of experience and knowledge. So some of the materials that we put out, the lessons learned, the questions that we've received and we've provided answers to, I think we, the, the quicker and uh, more effectively we get those answers out, uh, the, the, more, the more widely the benefits will, uh, will be accrue. Um, it certainly helped us internally, uh, not to make it about the, the regulator, but it certainly helped us internally to be a more effective uh, in thinking about future standards. So as the new standard on accounting auditing estimates and uh, the use of auditors use of specialists um, uh, are being implemented now, we're thinking of ways of replicating this. So we are more effective in monitoring, supporting, uh, and providing outreach to those who are affected by it. Um, we certainly act more uh, efficiently and effectively as a team internally, um, recognizing as the panel did this morning that those are a different type of standard than a disclosure standard, so the, the techniques may be different. Um, and hopefully the firms, um, as they're implementing the standard and they get more responsive, engaged interaction with the regulator, that provides some uh, comfort, I guess, or uh, more effective support in making decisions uh, on their methodologies or techniques going forward. So um, give, eliminate some of the uh, uncertainty in the process. We've got time for, there's one in the back, uh, probably two more questions, and then we'll, I think we're gonna head into uh, the next So phase. one of the questions that more of the uh, audit researchers that have an archival mindset, I really think they're probably thinking about things like it's not just the CAMs, it's the unexpected CAMs that might have a bigger influence on market behavior, investor behavior, analyst questions. So I've heard the panelists talk about some things that they think might be you know, correlates of, of CAMs, like critical accounting estimates. But if you were to try to help academics build an expectation model for how many CAMs will be present in different industry clients, what sort of things would you include besides just that there was a CAM in the prior year? because they do sound a little sticky, but I'm just wondering, how do we, how do we differentiate between this is a run of the mill, this is an expected CAM, business as usual, or this one's a little different, and may have well emerged maybe in the fourth quarter like you were talking about. Yeah, so I, I don't have a crisp answer, but I would point back to the going concern study in the latest Journal of Auditing that looked back to the Canadian experience when uh, auditors in Canada started disclosing a matter of emphasis on going concern. And if that study is any precursor, what it said is even when investors knew there was a going concern issue, if the disclosure by the auditor was more precise than expected or went further than expected, it changed behavior. That might be a hypothesis to apply here. Um, I doubt you're going to get for a number of years the ability to say, well, three is a good number, four is a good number. And I think what you're going to probably find is sometimes it's about what's in the CAM, not about its presence. So to Josh's example, you can have two companies with reporting unit goodwill CAMs, but one tells investors something more than they knew or had something interesting in it 
and the other confirmed what they already knew, and this one may have more influence and that one less. I want somebody to be impressed that I actually read the study on going concerned mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <okay. laughs> I have a suggestion for answering that, just based on the reading the CAM so far, is if you compare what the auditor, how the auditor describes the CAM versus how the company describes their critical accounting yes. policies, you may find some specificity to the auditor um, that, uh, and including the footnote disclosure, I mean, you may find some specificity there that will give you some insight on whether this was expected. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. That also compares to that footnote study that kind of, if companies waffle, you probably should worry. I think you're right, the auditors are going to be less inclined to, to use too many words to describe things. Any more questions? We might have time for, for one more, if there are any more questions. Okay, I think we're, Margo, I'm not seeing any. Okay, um, I, I wanna thank um, all of you for your time with the past hour and a half. Margo, um, excellent timing to you and your team on, on this agenda and on this panel. Um, just again, incredibly timely given recent events and, and, and uh, the journey that we're all on. And last but not least, I, I wanna thank our panel, Abe and the PCOB, Jen, Josh, Philip, and your respective firms, not just for uh, the last hour and a half, but all the very good work you're putting into this uh, as we move forward with a, just a, a very impactful change to the auditor's reporting model. So well done and, and thank you all. Thank you.